2 Corinthians, we are continuing in chapter 2. We were last week uh, finishing in the first four verses, and we'll continue on in, in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. I'll uh, encourage you to uh, stay tuned next week for application because um, Paul mentions uh, some topics here that uh, need additional, I think, encouragement uh, in learning and applying because of the other texts that are available that will help us to understand it more clearly. But there was a problem in Corinth. And uh, as you've read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you know that the congregation had some difficulties, as every congregation does. And so this letter was written to uh, respond to those challenging times that the congregation there uh, felt and uh, needed support from uh, the apostle. So let's begin. Um, in a word of prayer, and then we'll continue in our study. Father, we are thankful for Paul and for the giving of this letter to the Corinthians that we uh, can have as a guide in our own lives today. Help us, Father, to have wisdom as we uh, seek to find uh, solutions as he encouraged the church there to help us, Father, always to glorify you and to find in our example, in our, in our lives, the example of your son, Christ. Father, we're grateful for him, that he was willing to suffer for us and um, to take uh, our punishment for the, the sins that we've committed and through his shed blood to provide us uh, eternal hope through freedom from our sins and the judgment that's part of that. Thank you, Father, for your mercy even today, for the kindnesses that, that we've received, and we pray your blessing upon us as we look now into to your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. When I was uh, teaching in Slovakia, I had the opportunity to volunteer in school and, and teach English. And uh, sometimes it was difficult for the young students I had who were 16 to 18 years old to understand the meaning of words. And for example, they wanted to know what's the difference between something that's fragrant, something that stinks, something that has an aroma. Uh, you know, they, they want, do I, do I say that uh, the perfume stinks or do I say that it's fragrant? And so it became a little bit funny uh, sometimes the way they would use English because it certainly got your attention since it's not usually the way uh, we used it. And this idea of fragrance or aroma or smell comes up in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 uh, in the verses that follow from verse 5 as he talks about uh, the aroma of Christ. And certainly we are in some way uh, able to fulfill the description that he gives there in our lives today. So let's do that. Let's look uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians. Remember that Paul is making a defense of his integrity. Uh, some uh, enemies of Christ had infiltrated the church in Corinth, and they were trying to persuade the church there that Paul was not reliable, that you couldn't trust his words. He would say one thing in person and another thing in his writing. They were trying to separate people from their uh, faith uh, and, and trust in, in Paul's preaching of the word so that they might have an advantage or, over the people there. They could have been what are known as Judaizers, those people who were seeking to add the law uh, to the grace of Christ, or some other particular groups uh, who were trying to separate uh, the church in Corinth into various factions. So how did his integrity happen to come under question? Well, he'd written to them that he would that he planned to come and see them. In fact, he would uh, stop and see them on his way to Macedonia. And then when he returned to Ephesus from Macedonia, he would stop again uh, and uh, speak with them in a personal way and share uh, with them uh, additional blessing in the word of God. Uh, and so they, they were concerned because he didn't do that. And second of all, they were concerned by the strictness of his words concerning a brother uh, who was involved in a sinful relationship. And, and they accused him of, of trying to lord it over them uh, by his severe words. So Paul is writing this letter in order to explain to them uh, 
in 2 Corinthians what his true motives were, why he did the things that they are criticizing him for without considering the true motives. The first thing that uh, he told them at the end of chapter 1, 23 through 24, is that he didn't come to see them on the schedule that he had planned because he intended for their meeting to be one of joy, not of sorrow. And the problem was they had not responded appropriately to his letter. Uh, and they were not uh, at that time in a position uh, where he could be with them joyfully, but would in fact need to also speak uh, severely and, and perhaps cause them uh, some sorrow. And he didn't want to do that. And so for the opportunity to be with them joyfully, he postponed his trip there. Uh, the other thing that they needed to know is the motivation um, behind his activity was his anguish of heart. Um, he had written to them with many tears, not to make them sorrowful. Uh, he wanted them to know that he loved them and that he was concerned uh, about their eternal destiny. And he was so anguished, um, it uh, interfered in his uh, in his ministry, even for Christ, until he was able to find out how they had responded to his letter. So that's the the place where we've been in 2 Corinthians and why Paul is continuing uh, in verses 5 and following uh, the defense of, of his integrity. Um, Paul uh, mentions uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 13, a particular situation that was a problem in that congregation. And so he wants them uh, to resolve that situation before it comes there. In order to understand uh, what it is, let's take a look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 13, and we'll see uh, why it was of serious concern to Paul. He says, is it it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this uh, done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord." Your boasting is not good, he writes in verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven uh, leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Uh, do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. After reading these words from Paul, uh, we can see that his words were in fact quite uh, severe. It was a very, very serious situation that this brother was in, and it was serious that the church was tolerating it. And he was anguished in his heart for not just the brother, but for the whole church, and he wanted them to change. And so his teaching was designed to encourage the sinning brother to correct his situation that he might come back into fellowship with Christ. This is the background to what we have now in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, verses 
5 through 11, we find good news concerning this brother. Starting in verse uh, 5, he says, But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. It, it's not really Paul that this young man is causing uh, to have sour in the first case. It is the church in Corinth. They knew that he was sinning. And they apparently were proud that in their tolerance, they had allowed it to continue in their spiritual family. This was despite the fact that the sin of this young man shocked even the pagan community. The church instead should have been sorrowful, not just Paul and his concern for them. They should have been sorrowful uh, for what they had done and what they had neglected to do and uh, in, in speaking with this brother. But in verse 6, he goes on and says, sufficient for such a one, that is the brother, is this punishment which has was inflicted by the majority. Well, what was the punishment? They evidently withdrew from him after Paul said, remove him from uh, your midst. And so after he, the instructions, they let the young man know whose side spiritually he was on. In this world, there are only two sides. You are either with God or you are with Satan. Now, that doesn't mean everybody with Satan knows they are. And some people don't even mind saying that they are. They're kind of proud of it. But the point that he's trying to say to the church in Corinth, there's only two places to be. You're either with Christ or you're with Satan. Uh, and it wasn't walking with Christ that was characteristic of this young man. He was walking with Satan. Now, the idea that Paul had in his instruction was to cause the young man to think, to realize that his behavior was sinful, so that he would have an opportunity to change in order to save his soul. What the church did in removing him evidently worked. The punishment accomplished its purpose. The goal was to save the young man's soul. So when they withdrew from him and made it clear that he was on Satan's side, the young man repented. He changed, but the church didn't follow up on his repentance, or perhaps they didn't know exactly what to do or when, and they just left him in a sorrowful condition. So Paul continues in verse 7. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. So Paul tells the church to take the young, back, young man back. Don't hesitate. He's repented. This is good news. He's understood the message uh, that Paul was encouraging them to, to tell him. Uh, and here's where we pick up the theme from the first chapter. You remember in chapter one, we talked about how God comforts us and that comfort we've received, we share and comfort other people as we have opportunity. And that's what's happening here. Uh, this young man was in a sorrowful condition. Uh, and he's realized it, and now he, he, he is discouraged, and they need to comfort him with the comfort they received when the message of Christ led them to repentance and to seek forgiveness. Paul says, comfort your brother in sorrow. He's repented. If they didn't act, the sorrow of the young man would overwhelm him and he would be at the risk of just giving up. So it was time to let him know that they loved him and that they were thankful that he, re he repented. So in verse nine, Paul says, for to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. So we learn here that not only was the young man put to test, but so was the whole church. Paul begins to explain it's not the, just the young brother who needed to obey God. It was the rest of the church. Would the church act like it ought to act? Would the church respond to the word of God that Paul had delivered? This was a test. Not just the young brother needed to repent, but the church did. Uh, they knew that their brother was doing something that, that was sinful. But what they were doing was tolerating it and evidently had a great deal of pride in their tolerance. There's an application to us here as well. Our culture 
really honors and magnifies a willingness to tolerate all things under any circumstance and for any reason. Tolerance is a quality uh, that everyone admires. Uh, we need to consider seriously, though, this, the, the words that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, not all things should be tolerated. Not all things should be ignored, is what they were really doing. We shouldn't take pride when we or someone that we know in the, in the kingdom of God is involved in some kind of sinful behavior. And so the question might be, could the church today fall into the same type of situation, tolerating among the family of God some who are living in sin, and we all know it? Uh, and are we refusing to do anything about it? If we are tolerating the sin, then we are failing the test that Paul gave the church in Corinth. Uh, it is the test of our love for the individual who's sinning uh, and the test of our goal in Christ to save their soul. It's also a test of how we are going to view the word of God and apply it. Do we, do we love each other enough to tell one another uh, that we don't need to be going down this wide road that the whole world is following? Uh, do we love one another enough to encourage each other to take the narrow road, which means that some things that are tolerated in the world cannot be tolerated in the kingdom of God? We don't ignore sin. When the person repents, we forgive. This is discipline. And as Paul explains it here, discipline is the test of our love. James tells us in James chapter 1 that God disciplines us and he tests us. Uh, it's because of his love that these things happen. And if we persevere in the test, if we continue in the perseverance, it produces endurance, which leads to proven character and hope. Because we see that by God's grace and God's love, we can do what he says, even if it's difficult. Um, in verse 10, then, Paul goes on. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what have I forgiven if I have forgiven anything? I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. We don't know from the text exactly uh, why the Corinthians hadn't taken the young brother back on their own. Perhaps they thought Paul wouldn't be pleased with them if they took him back. Perhaps simply they didn't know uh, any timing. But like a pendulum, they were swinging in the opposite direction of the tolerance uh, to condemning the sin and not being willing uh, to accept the repentance and forgive the brother uh, that he might find encouragement or comfort. So Paul explains that the brother repents and the church there in Corinth forgives him, then he also uh, will forgive them for the sake of the church in the presence of Christ. He forgives, he doesn't have to be president Corinth. He's present before Christ. It's his word, it's his will that they are teaching and that Paul is sharing with them. And Paul can, can accept the repentance of a person without being in the presence of that person, but he doesn't want them to delay. Uh, he, he wants them uh, to uh, pursue bringing the brother back in and, 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 and restoring the love. And he tells why in verse 11 so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorance of, ignorant of his schemes. Sometimes it seems um, like maybe we're a bit ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Uh, we forget that there are only two sides uh, in the challenges that we face. There are those uh, who knowingly or unknowingly practice and serve Satan, and those uh, who are seeking knowingly to practice the teaching uh, of Christ. And, and Satan has a scheme for us. Satan has a plan. Uh, you know, if Satan was applying for a job uh, to be the adversary uh, and the enemy of God's people, he has quite a resume. You know, he's been doing this for more than 6,000 years. Can you imagine having someone come uh, to look for a job in a business where you are, even a preacher coming here looking for a job as our preaching ministry? He says, well, did you know I have 6,000 years worth of experience? Whoa, that would catch my attention. You know what Satan knows? 
He knows all about human beings, our weaknesses, our sins, the lies we tell ourselves, the lies he whispers to our ears through the world. Uh, he knows all about that. He knows exactly what our weaknesses are. And the challenge is, do we? Are we aware of the things that often get us into trouble? Get us into trouble with people in the church, as well as people out of the church? Is there something about my method, my approach, my faith, my belief, uh, that I am not realizing is either a scheme of Christ or, well, we wouldn't say a scheme because Christ is known. Uh, the plan of God, the plan of Christ for us, or is it the scheme of Satan that he keeps us from being aware of as long as he, can, as he can? The word of God is given to us as a guide. And the history that we have in the Old Testament is also given so that we can see how God asks, uh, acts and how Satan, in fact, seeks to destroy us. And so a, a ser Satan apparently likes to find people who are discouraged. Someone who is burdened by the guilt of sin and overwhelmed by the sorrow that follows. You know, that makes our culture right now ripe for the working of Satan. Millions of people are discouraged. Millions of people are overwhelmed by sorrow. Satan's scheme is to destroy them. Uh, and our responsibility as Christ's church is to look for ways to give comfort and hope and point them to an eternal destiny uh, of blessing under the care of, of, of God. Satan knows that if a Christian or any person, person continues in discouragement, he or she is likely to go back to a life uh, uh, consistent with Satan's goals. We do what is easier. Uh, sometimes sin is more comfortable. That's the challenge we face. That's the challenge that the church in Corinth faced. It was more comfortable to joke and snigger and laugh about this brother who's sleeping with his father's wife than to stand up and say, excuse me, for your sake, for the sake of this woman, and perhaps even your father, you need to see that this is not acceptable behavior. God's rules of morality are not important to many people in our time and culture. Um, they don't see a problem with the kind of morality that Paul talks about here. Uh, someone asked me recently if I noticed a difference when I came back from Europe to live in the United States, and I said, I did, and it surprised me because I came back every year for a few weeks. Uh, and yet when I got here to live, I thought, yikes, there are things on TV here that were never on TV 25, 30 years ago. There are things going on here by the approval of law that would have been scandalous 25 or 30 years ago. Cultures change, and we can become tolerant in order to please, please our culture if we're not careful. There are, that doesn't mean we hate people. Paul didn't tell the church in Corinth to hate the brother who was sleeping with his, his father's wife. He encouraged them to discipline him for the sake of his soul. That's love. Speak the truth in love. Find a way to bring up this subject to help the brother uh, to come back to Christ because his soul is at, uh, at stake. Uh, and in verse 12, we find that Paul was so distressed by this problem in Corinth, among others, as you remember reading, uh, he wrote, furthermore, in verse 12, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Here's something that I've learned from my experience at the church in, in uh, Bratislava. We had a serious problem with a leader in the congregation there, a serious problem with morality, and it had a negative impact on the church. Uh, it, in fact, was nearly divisive, and when we decided it was our responsibility uh, to say something, people left the church. This is what happens sometimes. 
when you decide in love and courage to stand for the word of God. And, and it interferes with our ministry. Paul is telling the church in Corinth his concern for their lack of biblical response had so distressed him that it affected his evangelism. It affected an opportunity to preach the gospel. This is going to happen to churches throughout the world during this pandemic. If we are so focused on uh, our own sorrow, on our own uh, challenges and difficulties, we'll not have the heart and the mind to share the gospel of Jesus and help people come out of that uh, sorrowful uh, environment. We have an opportunity for our own health's sake the health sake of the church and for the saved, uh, for the lost who would become saved, uh, to not be distracted from preaching the word. We can suffer difficulty and do God's work. Why? Because every Christian in every generation has faced something like this. Every generation from the time of the first century to now has had some form of difficulty. Paul preached while being in prison. He preached on his way to prison. He encouraged people to preach in spite of his, his prison, and they did. And the result was people who never would have heard the gospel heard it because they watch. They see how we handle our problems. Do we blow up in a fit? Do we ignore immorality? Or do we pursue? the way that God has said for us to live. We have an opportunity, and Paul uh, had an opportunity to preach the gospel. He was too troubled to pursue it. Um, Paul is so anguished in his spirit, uh, as he writes here, that he finally left Troas and went to Macedonia, hoping to find Titus, who might have word of how the church had responded uh, to his letter. So we find now in verse 14 how Paul continues his explanation and defense of his behavior. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The word for fragrance here is a neutral word. It means simply to smell. can be positive, uh, can be negative. It depends on the context. Um, so he says, and through us, uh, God diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are a fragrance, and this is a, a different word. This is a positive aroma. You know, we might have said, uh, and through us diffuses the smell of his knowledge in every place. But smell sometimes, you know, can be a little bit negative. Oh, your, your perfume really smells. Mm, that's not going to work. Uh, it's, not, it's not good to say it stinks either, uh, although you may think that. It, uh, it's better to speak of it as an aroma. But here Paul says, we, the people, Christ himself, uh, be, diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Our faithfulness and our preaching of the word of God follows us like our fragrance that we're wearing, whether cologne or perfume or whatever it is. It can, it can be detected uh, oftentimes without any words. When the church in Corinth was tolerating sin, the pagans were just scandalized. That's a stinky church. I mean, what else could they say? They didn't have very high morals, but at least they didn't do that. Uh, and so we don't want that. We don't want the stink of sin to follow us. We want the aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. For we are fragrant, positive aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Uh, where we go, our aroma has an effect. To those who are being saved, it's positive. To those who are being lost, it's negative. And so he says, to the one, an aroma from death to death, to a, a, the other, an aroma from life to life. And he asks himself in face of this, that people watch, uh, 
the t people smell, the people hear, wherever we go, whatever we do. Uh, and we are sinful people, let's be honest. Paul says, and who is adequate, adequate for these things? How can we take the gospel to a smelly, stinky world uh, without being smelly and stinky ourselves? This is a challenge. Paul gives thanks to God here. Notice this, now thanks be to God who sometimes lead us in, in triumph in Christ. He didn't say sometimes. He says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Who are we following? Because if we are following Christ, God always leads us in triumph in Christ. Doesn't mean there's there's not going to be difficulties and failures, uh, mistakes here and there. But the idea is if we are seeking to follow Christ and we're following Christ and preaching the gospel and in living in this world, we will have the blessing of what Paul promises here, the opportunity to thank God for how he leads us. Uh, to understand the metaphor here, it helps a little bit to know that it's taken actually, from the behavior of the Roman army after they uh, have had a con uh, con conquering fight, a victory over their enemies. Uh, William Barclay describes the Roman triumph in this way. He says, a triumph uh, is the procession of the victorious general as he marched through the streets of Rome to the capital. In this march, in this parade, so to speak, first came the state officials and the Senate. Then came the people blowing the trumpets, getting everybody's attention. Then were carried the spoils taken from the conquered land, uh, images of what they captured, portions of, cit of the citadels, of important things uh, that might have been unknown about that city. They carried these in front of them. And then followed a white bull that was offered as a sacrifice for their thanksgiving of victory. Then there walked the captive people, the princes, the leaders, the generals. These people were chained because they were captives, and they would be thrown into prison in all probability only long enough to arrange for their execution. Then came the government officers and magistrates who had all the legal documents saying these people are losers, they're worthy of death, and we've got the papers here to give you permission. Then the priests came of their pagan worship, swinging their censers with the sweet-smelling incense burning in them. Uh, and sometimes this incense creates a memory that's better than even words that we have. Uh, sometimes you might have a certain smell that reminds you uh, of a particular time in a particular place. In this particular situation, uh, this uh, scent was connected to victory. And when it drifted out among the people in the city, it drifted out, giving them uh, the smell of victory. Uh, after the priest, there came the general himself, and finally came the army wearing their uniforms and their decorations. Following that, the cheering crowds, and it was a tremendous day uh, in Rome when they had that kind of victory. So Paul now speaks of the true nature of the Christian ministry when he connects this bit of background history to his words concerning the triumph of Christ. He speaks of a God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. God will spread his word successfully throughout the, the, the earth, throughout the world, even through the frustrating limitations of sinful people and weak people like us, because we are, in fact, imperfect. It may be that Paul views himself and faithful Christians as those who were led captive by the enemies of God, and it would certainly appear that way with Paul uh, and many of his writings, because he was either going to prison, in prison, uh, out of prison and about to go back to prison. Uh, and so he maybe thought, well, uh, people might look at this and feel like, you know, the, 
the enemy has uh, got me in its possession. Possession, I am its captive. But the promise, the promise is what appears to be a victory for the enemy is actually the triumphal uh, march of God. God turns apparent defeat into victory. If Paul is describing himself and, and Christians, as captives in this march of the enemy, then they are a fragrance of the knowledge of Christ, a knowledge that brings uh, salvation to people who respond to this knowledge and find a relationship with God. So uh, in spite of Paul's difficulties and the number of times he was in prison, the fragrance that he carried with them, even in chains, as he described himself, was the word of God. And people heard they were able to get the aroma of Christ, the word of Christ, because Paul was taken captive and taken to places that he would not necessarily have gone. And people heard, we find out, even in the household uh, of Caesar. So it may be that Paul views himself and faithful Christians uh, as being led, apparently by the enemy, but in actuality because of the word they share and the life that they live that point people to Christ, they are actually in the triumph of God. Now, Paul speaks of the true nature of the Christian ministry when he talks about this. He speaks of a God um, who leads us, if we're willing, uh, in a triumphal procession in Christ. God will spread his word successfully throughout the earth. We can be sure of this. It may come more quickly in some areas, more slowly in others. It may be a few here or a large number of people there, but he promises success, even through the frustrating limitations of sinful people and people like us who are weak. It may be that Paul views himself then uh, as an example to the church in Corinth that they could see in his life uh, how the suffering that he experienced enabled him to cause the word of God to, to spread out as a, as a pleasant aroma. The Corinthian church needed to suffer. Maybe it was a suffering of their pride. Maybe it was an embarrassment in the community. Uh, maybe it was the difficulty of standing for a morality that was so the opposite of everything that you would typically find in Corinth. Because what we are afraid to speak up about, we have a tendency to tolerate. And tolerance generally leads uh, in, in a direction that is worse. And so Paul wants the, the church in Corinth uh, to, to not see this whole situation as a defeat, but to see it as a victory. Uh, he wants them to know that in spite of his difficulties, God spread the, the grace and the knowledge of his son Jesus. And in spite of the difficulties that they will face, whether in dealing with these various problems among false teachers or amongst those uh, in the community who opposed uh, the morality of Christ, they can still find victory. Uh, if we're taking a, a, an application here, um, maybe what we can remember is that even in the faith of difficulties, if we are pursuing the ministry of Christ, it will eventually re result in the triumph of souls, few or many. Even in our persecution or suffering, we can spread the word of God, and the triumph will be one of spiritual uh, victory in Christ. But let's ask ourselves this. Are we showing evidence? of the aroma of Christ going out from us? Are we influencing people around us to come to a knowledge of Christ and to find eternal life? We need to persevere as Paul did and not allow the difficulties of our times uh, to prevent us from carrying out the ministry that we have been given. Paul encourages the church to be victorious and faithful over Satan. That was the purpose of what he had instructed the church in Corinth to do regarding the sin of this younger brother. The repentance of the church and the return of the young brother was a victory against Satan. 
Now, this is what the verse is about triumph are, po are pointing to in the immediate context. Satan expect, expected to take the younger brother as a captive to eternal destruction. That was his scheme. We need to wake up. Are people around you in trouble? Are people around you miserable for some reason? Satan is going to use that unless we take the comfort with which we've been comforted and comfort them. It doesn't mean we agree with their sin or we ignore that they need to obey the gospel. We need to be actively involved and God will watch and God will give us the opportunity if our hearts and our minds are open. Uh, Paul expected to take the younger brother as a captive to eternal destruction. But because of the word of God sent by Paul, uh, the younger brother repented and defeated Satan's scheme. Uh, in the victory against Satan, Paul sees Jesus making a triumphant parade, winding its way through the whole Roman Empire and ultimately through the entire world. And it has come to us and it has come to our country. Every empire I've mentioned a number of times, every empire in the world, has been defeated. Every empire has ceased to exist, but the aroma of Christ has continued to go on. In every age, the word of God has found some and preserved some from the destruction that Satan intends to, to bring upon any nation, including our nation. Paul pictures all humanity having an opportunity to inhale the smell of those who speak and live for Christ. And either they will be convicted by it and purpose, purposely uh, living joyously in its sweetness, or they will reject the witness and they will turn away their noses from what they consider nauseating stench. Don't let it bother you that people react that way. You know in advance they will. They did that with Jesus. They did that with the apostles. They did that with the church. Pay attention to those who are receiving the aroma positively. These are the people we're looking for. Satan wants to get us off of his, uh, Satan wants to catch us in his scheme by getting us off of God's plan. Don't let him do it. Listen to John chapter 7 excuse me, John chapter 3, 17 through 21, and we'll close with this illustration. Uh, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Instead of using the metaphor of aroma, he uses the metaphor of light. When we travel, through our communities. We are light in the darkness. Uh, and sometimes people don't like the light being uh, pointed at them. One of the things I learned in living uh, in Texas while I was going to school is when you turn on the light, the cockroaches run. Uh, and we need to be aware that the light of God's word and the forgiveness of Christ is not something that their hearts are ready to receive. Perhaps in seeing how we live, excuse me, their hearts may be open. In Christ's triumph, there is no room for personal pride or credit. This is God's triumph. All glory goes to him for all the victories that are accomplished by the power of his gospel. Are we letting the gospel speak? Are we allowing the power of God to come out through us like an aroma to the people who need to hear a message of hope? In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, um, we see this fulfillment in 
Paul speaking of Christ. He says he had, had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Uh, and uh, we'll look next week at some specific application uh, of what Paul here writes. But remember verse 17 as we uh, end for today. Uh, Paul writes, for we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in, uh, in Christ uh, in the sight of God. He's already said in verse 16, huh, how can we hope to do this? Um, we do it from sincerity. We do it from God. We speak of Christ and his power will work for those hearts that are opened. The word will be planted like a seed and it will grow. So thank you for, for joining us. We'll continue uh, next week in talking about application of these verses. Please join me in a closing prayer. Father, thank you for Paul's words. Help us to be the aroma of your son's words and your son's life. Help us to be, as we pass through our community, people that draw the attention of those who are seeking for hope and comfort, who are seeking for eternal joy. Uh, and if we meet those, and we surely will, uh, who find our aroma to be uh, unpleasant, help us uh, to behave in the right way before them, that we might uh, plant a seed uh, of hope that they will eventually come back to. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. We praise, pray this in your son's name. Amen.